Hello and welcome to Wake Up and Smell the Freedom's monthly presentation and this month our presentation was on the Commerce Clause. So what do we know about the Commerce Clause? The Commerce Clause comes from Article 1, Section 8, Clause 3 of the U.S. Constitution. If you're unfamiliar with this particular clause, we're going to show you a quick video here to give you an overview of it. Let's watch. One of the attacks that the, the living constitutionalists have waged against this revival of original understanding of the Constitution uh, is that we, we never can understand the true intent of the founders. I am always skeptical that we can know what was the original intent behind a constitutional provision. Well, that's not what originalism is. Uh, it's not what their subjective, unspoken intent was. It's what they conveyed by the words they used to the people who would then subsequently vote to ratify the Constitution or the amendments. I'm also skeptical that even if we knew it should be binding on us today. If the words no longer mean anything, then we don't have a Constitution that binds and limits the power of government, and government can do whatever they want. The Commerce Clause. It's 16 words and two commas. They're not even hard words. Most people can figure out what it means. Sadly, Congress is not most people. Well, I would assume it would be in the Commerce Clause. That's it, how Congress legislates all kinds of programs. Do you, is your answer that they can do anything? The, the federal government, uh, yes, can do most anything in this country. Now, I don't worry about the Constitution on this, to be honest. I <laughs> My, well, that's that's a jackpot, brother. What was originally intended to be a restriction on states has been rewritten into a grant of virtually unlimited power to Congress. How did we get here? What is meant by the term commerce? The world is so different now from what it was in 1787. But I think that what the framers intended with the Commerce Clause was if Congress broad authority to regulate all aspects of the economy. Really? All aspects of the economy? commerce at the time of the founding meant trade. You had manufacturing, that was not commerce. You had agriculture, that was not commerce. You had retail sales, that was not commerce. The issue involves the economic welfare of the United States, but it also involves the balance of power between the federal government and the government of the states. Regulating commerce among the states meant regulating the trade. So a state couldn't impose trade barriers, which often were the precursor to war. The Commerce Clause was created to quash the commercial warfare that threatened to break the states apart. And for over 100 years, Congress exercised the commerce power only in that way, preventing interference with interstate commerce. But the Great Depression, the New Deal, and FDR's court packing plan put substantial pressure on the courts to accept dramatically expanded federal powers. To justify new laws, the court seized on a few lines from an 1824 court case. The case known as Gibbons versus Ogden. Marshall wrote a fairly narrow opinion. Well, because his formulation said that commerce which does not have a substantial effect on other states. And they've picked up on that rhetoric. And the Supreme Court very broadly defined the scope of Congress's commerce power. And now said, well, anything that does have a substantial effect on commerce. Any activity? that affects more than one state uh, can be regulated by Congress, which was not Marshall's intent at all. Where are you leading us, Mr. Marshall? Uh, and then all of a sudden, you get Wickard versus Filburn, which is probably the broadest, most expansive interpretation ever given of the Commerce Clause. Roscoe Filburn grew wheat on his farm for his own home consumption. His entire crop was fed to his livestock, consumed by his family, or stored for planting in the next year. The wheat was never bought, never sold, and never left the state. So he was deliberately not engaging in interstate commerce. And yet the Supreme Court ruled that his crop could be regulated under the authority of the Interstate Commerce Clause. Because if everyone grew their own wheat, no one would buy any. Their failure to engage in commerce would have a substantial effect on commerce and therefore Congress could regulate it. Congress can regulate any activity that taken cumulatively has a substantial effect on interstate commerce. And of course, that turns the Commerce Clause upside down. And it's no longer a power to regulate interstate commerce, it's a power to regulate everything. Wickard is wrongly decided, and uh, it needs to be overturned. In the wake of the New Deal, the Commerce Clause continued to expand into all aspects of American life. 
From 1937 to 1995, not a single piece of legislation was struck down as exceeding the scope of Congress's Commerce Clause authority. And then the court decided United States versus Lopez. The issue at hand was the Gun-Free School Zones Act. The statute prohibited possession of a gun within 100 yards of a school. Now, nobody supports possession of a gun within 100 yards of school. Texas had a law against that, in fact. The question is whether it was in the federal government's authority. For the majority, the relationship to interstate commerce was too attenuated. There was no interstate commerce connection to that statute, and they struck it down. They don't explicitly overrule Wickard versus Filburn, even though the reasoning of the case cannot be squared with Wickard versus Filburn. Well, the opportunity confronts them to address that in the medical marijuana case out of California. Angel Raish grew and consumed medical marijuana in her home, which was legal under California's Compassionate Use Act, but illegal under federal law. Uh, it's like the homegrown weed case. Uh, this should have been a judgment left to California. The court said producing a crop that's bought and sold interstate commerce, albeit illegally for marijuana, is economic activity. That reaffirms Wickard versus Filburn and largely repudiates the Commerce Clause revolution of, of, of Lopez. So just how powerful is the Commerce Clause? We may find out soon. A number of states have challenged the uh, Obamacare, the, the nationalized health care bill that came out this past year. Um, and the first challenge is on Commerce Clause grounds. The question revolves around the individual mandate. And that's why under my plan, individuals will be required to carry basic health insurance. Congress can force economic transactions. In the 1964 Civil Rights Act, the court said hotels and restaurants can be forced under Congress' commerce power to serve or rent to African Americans, even if they don't want to. Requiring people to have health insurance meets the rational basis test. Just like every court has said, it meets rational basis review to require that all drivers have car insurance. Everybody in America just about has to get auto insurance. Well, there's a huge difference. The act of driving is not a constitutional right, it's a privilege. And so we can impose conditions on the exercise of that privilege under the state's police power. Living is not a privilege, but it's a right. And I can't impose a condition on the mere act of living, which is what the Obamacare mandate does. If you don't follow the mandate and buy the insurance policy that the government orders you to buy, then you get taxed. You might call this a penalty. The government is going through uh, contortions trying to say it's, it's not a tax. Nobody considers that a tax increase. Well, if it's not a tax, they don't have authority to do it, so they have to say it is a tax. One reason that the government may want to call it a tax for purpose of litigation is it's clear that you can't argue that a tax is an unconstitutional taking of private property without just compensation. But if it is a tax, it does two things. It violates President Obama's pledge that he wouldn't raise taxes. You can't just make up that language and decide that that's called a tax increase. And it's a tax not tied to income. That means it's a direct tax. And the Constitution is very clear. Direct taxes have to be apportioned according to population. Well, this would be apportioned according to whether you bought the policy or not, not according to population. And it's invalid under Article I of the Constitution. I think the Supreme Court will uphold this. I think it may never go to the Supreme Court. If my prediction is right, the Courts of Appeals will uphold this as constitutional. The Supreme Court's going to have to take it. It's too big a deal for an intermediate appellate court to have the final say on it. So where is the limit of congressional power under the Commerce Clause? The limit is the extent of the creativity of the members of Congress. If I wanted to sponsor a bill and it said, Americans, you have to eat three vegetables and three fruits every day, does that violate the Commerce Clause? Sounds like a dumb law. Do we have the power to tell people what they have to eat every day? In her view of the Constitution, there's nothing that Congress can't do. All she said was, oh, that would never happen, that's a foolish law. She never said it would be unconstitutional. I think what people choose to eat well might be regarded as a personal liberty. The government can force you to eat three meals a day, eat McDonald's hamburgers, not eat McDonald's hamburgers. What we put into our bodies really is part of our freedom, but there's not a freedom to not have medical care. Buy General Motors cars instead of Toyota cars, in theory, Congress could use its commerce power to acquire people by cars. In reality, it's a ridiculous hypothetical. All sorts of things that the government now compel you to do if the individual mandate is upheld. Power can be used in silly ways 
and the Constitution isn't our protector against undesirable government actions, only unconstitutional ones. And ultimately, the fight over the scope of the Commerce Clause is about that. Do we have a government that is limited in purpose and in its powers to do only the things that we, the sovereign people, gave it to do for certain designated purposes? Or is it an amorphous, unlimited government that can do to us whatever it wants? What have we got? A republic or a monarchy? A republic, if you can keep it so. So a lot of the issues we are having today with the expansiveness of the federal government is because of a court case that happened back during the height of the Great Depression. So let's take a closer look at that court case with our next video, which goes deeper into the subject of this landmark case, Wickard versus Filburn. The expansion of federal regulations is largely based on a broad interpretation of the Commerce Clause. That's the part of the Constitution that gives the feds power over interstate commerce. When people complain about the federal government sticking its nose into their business, it's almost always laws drafted under the Commerce Clause that they're complaining about. And if you spend much time listening to congressional debates on the subject, you're likely to hear these three words. Wickard versus Filburn. Wickard v. Filburn. It started with Wickard v. Filburn. They're talking about a Supreme Court case involving an Ohio farmer named Roscoe Filburn. It was the middle of the Great Depression, and farmer Filburn was looking for a cheap way to feed his livestock. So he planted 23 acres with wheat, and that's when the government stepped in. Good morning. Hiya. To shore up wheat prices, the federal government had placed limits on production, and Roscoe Filburn's wheat crop exceeded those limits by exactly 239 bushels. So they hit him with a $117 fine. But Filburn insisted he was growing wheat just for his own use and for his hungry animals, and that it never entered into commerce at all, much less interstate commerce. The case ended up in the Supreme Court, which found against Roscoe Filburn. The justices held that even though this particular farmer's wheat did not enter the market, growing his own meant he was refraining from buying wheat from somebody else. And if lots of other farmers around the country did the same thing, it could drive down wheat prices. And that would affect interstate commerce. That decision came down in 1942, and it opened the floodgates to federal regulation of anything remotely related to commerce. The precedent of Wickard v. Filburn has served as the legal underpinning for federal laws covering everything from labor standards to consumer protection to endangered species. And it was at the center of the debate over the Affordable Care Act in the spring of 2012. The Filburn case is the outer reach of the Commerce Clause. So, Roscoe Filburn had a barn. E-I-E-I-O. Exactly, much like this one. What did Wickard v. Filburn do in terms of like the broader relationship of people to the federal government? Well, once the federal government can reach inside and tell even a farmer like Roscoe how much wheat he can grow to feed his own livestock, then the federal government seems to be able to tell you to do anything, and that's not the power originally the federal government had. It was the states that could basically regulate your activity. Right. And so that really changed the relationship of the citizenry to the federal government. So here's my question, though. You, you, your concern, I know, is with liberty. The idea that we have rights, that we have liberty, that, that the government cannot take away from us. But it does seem to matter to you which government does it. Yes. There are things that the state government yes. can do, and you're cool with that if the state government wants us to. No, I may not be cool with that. You're not cool with that. N maybe. It depends what it is. But why we need a division is because once you go to the national level and it's one size fits all for the whole country and you don't like that, where are you going to go? I mean, where, where if you're an individual going to go, where if your business going to go? You've got to leave the country. But if you're doing it at the state level and you don't like that, well, just go across the state line, do it somewhere different over there. In other words, the ability to exit, the ability to leave, the ability to vote with your feet yeah. is a constraint on what local governments can do. Once you go to the national level and it's one size fits all for the whole country and you don't like that, where are you going to go? So let's review. Because Roscoe Filburn grew his own wheat, he didn't buy any wheat. Because he didn't buy any wheat, it might influence others not to buy wheat. And if others didn't buy wheat, then that could cause wheat prices to fall. 
And if wheat prices fell, that would affect interstate commerce. And that effect on interstate commerce would exasperate the Great Depression. So for that reason, the federal government had the authority to regulate the amount of wheat Roscoe Filburn produced on his own property. Now Thomas Jefferson laid bare this trick, that the power-hungry rationalizers of increased federal power used to justify the increase when he commented on an 1800 proposal to incorporate a copper mining company, something clearly only in the state's domain. Congress are authorized to defend the nation. Ships are necessary for defense. Copper is necessary for ships. Mines are necessary for copper. A company necessary to work the mines. And who can doubt the reasoning who has ever played it, this is the house that Jack built. And that's the trick. Over and over and over, this is how the federal government gives itself the authority to do anything they deem necessary over us. So what was the Commerce Clause's intention, and why was it put in the Constitution in the first place? You have to remember that during the time of the colonies, each colony functioned as an independent country. What happened at that time is the states with harbors would take advantage of other states without harbors. Tariffs were placed on goods as they would pass through other states. Sometimes even multiple states would tack on tariffs on the same item as it passed through their territory. This would drive up the prices, ruining businesses in the Americas or stopping trade. In some instances, it would be cheaper for items to be brought from abroad rather than pay for the increased price of a domestic good with the tariff on it. Oliver Ellsworth in the Connecticut Ratifying Convention stated, Our being tributaries to our sister states is in consequence of the want of a federal system. The state of New York raises 60 or 80,000 pounds a year by impost. Connecticut consumes about one-third of the goods upon which this impost is laid, and consequently pays one-third of this sum to New York. If we import by the medium of Massachusetts, she has an impost, and to her we pay a tribute. If this is done when we have the shadow of a national government, what shall we not suffer when even that shadow is gone? Just an FYI, the shadow of a national government that Oliver Ellsworth is referring to was the Articles of Confederation. This was the precursor to our present Constitution. What he was basically saying was, if the states are able to behave this way with their current federal government, how would they behave if even that didn't exist? In the Virginia Ratifying Convention, Patrick Henry described the situation thusly, Connecticut and New Jersey have their localities also. New York lies between them. They have no ports and are not importing states. New York is an importing state, and taking advantage of its situation makes them pay duties for all the articles of their consumption. Thus, these two states, being obliged to import all they want through the medium of New York, pay the particular taxes of that state. What Patrick Henry was complaining about in this quote is basically this. Under the Articles of Confederation, each state had to pay up an annual portion of money to the government that was regulated by the Articles of Confederation so that it could function. What was happening in this instance was Connecticut and New Jersey were forced to import their goods through New York. New York would charge these two states a tariff in the amount that it had to pay to the federal government each year, thus allowing itself to keep its own money and thus enriching its people. So this is the reason the Commerce Clause was placed in the Constitution, to help alleviate this kind of behavior of one state on another. James Madison further clarified the clause when he wrote in Federalist No. 32, a very material object of this power was the relief of the states which import and export through other states from the improper contributions levied on them by the latter. At the time, the states were adding additional tariffs and levies against goods being transported through their area. The Constitution, and more specifically this clause, sought to alleviate one state from doing this to another. Alexander Hamilton's explanation of interstate commerce in Federalist No. 2 was that an unrestrained intercourse between the states themselves will advance the trade of each by an interchange of their respective productions. Transportation today is pretty much a non-issue. Companies are free to trade and no one really thinks of state lines like they used to, to where each state was sovereign and crossing the border was a big deal. Everyone looks at the big picture of the United States, which is why it is so easy for many to misconstrue or mischaracterize the meaning of this clause. But the Commerce Clause is used today as a tool to expand government power into ever more areas of the state's economies and the people's lives. The key is, if something can be passed and then the Supreme Court okays it, then this effectively has moved the goalposts on the limitations of its powers. It has effectively redefined what is commerce. This further consolidates the power and control of Washington has over us and was never intended by the founders or the ratifiers of the Constitution. 
But as always, the government has many more rules for us than they do for themselves, and they tend to make up their own rules as they go along. Obamacare is nothing new. It's just the same old trick with different window dressing, a strained and torturous version of the Commerce Clause being used that nobody seems to understand or say anything about. Here's a video of Senator Dick Durbin, a Democrat from Illinois, with his take on the constitutionality of Obamacare as viewed through the Commerce Clause. Let's see what he has to say. Around here, Senator. Okay. So let's talk about your hearings today on the Hill. Uh, obviously, a uh, federal judge in Florida, and for disclosure purposes, a friend of mine, uh, uh, ruled that, that the individual mandate is unconstitutional. You're going to hold hearings today. What do you hope to accomplish? Well, I'm chairing the Senate Judiciary Committee, uh, and we're going to have a hearing on the constitutionality of the Health Care Reform Act. Uh, and I will tell you, Joe, that you've got to step back and take a look at the big picture. This law has been challenged in 16 different federal courts. Twelve judges have dismissed the challenge. Four have considered it. Two ruled that it was constitutional, two unconstitutional. So it isn't exactly a wave of sentiment against this law. It, it indicates to me that there are important constitutional questions, which we'll get into today. And of course, the, the chances are good, and you can never predict what's going to happen. You know this better, certainly, than anybody when a circuit takes a look at it. But the 11th Circuit is one of the more conservative circuits. Do you hope this ruling goes through the regular process, the 11th Circuit? Uh, uh, reviews it and most likely upholds it and then goes to the Supreme Court or would you like this to go immediately to the Supreme Court? Well, I'm not sure which is better, but we're ultimately going to wait on the Supreme Court. Remember in history that Social Security, the minimum wage, the civil rights law were all challenged and in many lower courts uh, were found unconstitutional and yet survived. So ultimately the Supreme Court I think has to take this matter up. We have cases now in Michigan, Virginia and Florida. Any one of those cases, maybe all of them, will make it to the Supreme Court. What, what do you believe Judge Vincent got wrong in his ruling um, two days ago? A number of things. First, the Commerce Clause. The Commerce Clause okay. is expansive. If you don't believe that the health insurance industry is commerce, it represents 18% okay. of the economy, all of the health delivery in this country. Senator, so it's a major part of Senator, America's commerce. Senator, we're going to interrupt you. We, we apologize, but we're going back to Cairo. I don't know if you have a monitor there, but something's going on there. So Senator Durbin feels that just because the word commerce is used, that automatically gives the federal government authority to regulate it. Now you know the biggest trick that the federal government uses to gain control over us and our lives. Let's get one final word on the matter from Judge Andrew Napolitano. Let's put aside the terrible unintended consequences of Obamacare for a moment. The main reason the big government types in both parties think they can shove this legislation down our throats is their belief that one phrase in the Constitution, the Commerce Clause, gives them the right to regulate health care. This is not preserving the Constitution, as they all took an oath to do, but evading it. The Commerce Clause is the federal government's excuse to regulate anything it wants. The Commerce Clause gives the Congress the right to regulate interstate commerce. Its original intent was to enable Congress to keep commerce between the states regular, to keep it moving by preventing the states from imposing tariffs on each other. One of the most devastating Supreme Court cases for those who believe in the Constitution was a case called Wickard against Filburn. In this 1942 case, a farmer named Roscoe Filburn from Montgomery, Ohio, wanted to grow wheat to feed his family and his chickens. The wheat he grew was entirely consumed on his farm, and it was never sold. Thus, it never moved across interstate lines. And since it was neither bought nor sold, it wasn't commerce. Nevertheless, the government, under FDR's Soviet-style central planning, fined Roscoe Filburn for growing too much wheat. The government argued that because the farmer was growing the wheat, he would not purchase the wheat on an open market. It also argued that if all other similarly situated farmers did the same, their decisions in the aggregate would affect interstate commerce. And therefore, Farmer Filburn's actions, which consisted of using the wheat in his barn and his kitchen, could be regulated by the federal bureaucracy. Essentially, the federal government was punishing him for growing too much wheat and not buying any from his neighbors. At the time, FDR was trying to outdo his friend, Russian dictator Joseph Stalin, in centrally planning the economy. 
The court sided with the government and ruled that under the Commerce Clause, the federal government did have the right to limit this farmer's wheat production. Now, why am I talking about this ridiculous case from the Depression years? I'll tell you why. Because your federal government used this case in its arguments to Judge Henry Hudson in Richmond last month in support of Obamacare. Your federal government argued to a federal judge that if FDR could punish farmer Filburn for growing too much wheat in 1942, then President Obama can punish you for not buying health care in 2014. Fortunately, Judge Hudson would have none of this, and neither should you. And when the government makes ridiculous arguments in your name, you should know about it. The government is out of control, America. It wants to tell us what to eat and what to buy, and soon what to wear and where to go. It watches us in the streets and at airports and at bus stations. Soon it will try to watch us in our homes. What is the point of a constitution, of having it as the law of the land? if the government is going to ignore all the rights it guarantees by intentionally misusing a three-word clause. Remember what Jefferson said about all this. When the government becomes destructive of freedom, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it.